I'm going to read two testimonies. One is of a wife and the other will be the husband of the wife. This will be uh, the testimony of Kay Dorokovic. Um, I'm going to have some commentary after I read these because they're two very, very special people that God brought into my life a number of years ago. And uh, it's noteworthy to just share a little bit of what went on behind the scenes that people wouldn't know otherwise. So let's uh, read uh, Kay's testimony here. Uh, it's titled, Let Me Live or Let Me Die. I was diagnosed as having cancer on my female organs. To combat the cancer eating away at my insides, my doctor decided to give me a gold radium treatment. As it turned out, I was given too much gold radium. The results were burned intestines, kidneys, stomach, and other internal organs. The day came when I got so bad that a priest came and gave me my last rites because the doctors weren't certain I was going to live. Through endless days and nights of suffering, through agony beyond what words can describe, through all the surgeries and experimentation performed on me to keep me going, the doctor, the doctor finally said one day, we've done all we can do for you. We're going to let you go home and die in peace. They closed up my stomach and prepared me so I could go home to die. But just before I left the hospital, they put me in a wheelchair and wheeled me down to a little chapel in the hospital. I wanted to have communion one last time. Inside the little chapel, I began to silently ponder my fate. What was it like to die? Would I be able to see my father and mother on the other side? Would my suffering be over through all eternity? Or would that just mark the beginning of more suffering to come? As I prepared myself to receive the wafer and the wine, the, symbol of, the symbolism of what I was about to do grew significantly, significantly important. Do this in remembrance of me, words of Jesus. Those were the thoughts that echoed through my mind as I remembered those words spoken by him as I was taught in my catechism class at an early age. At that moment, I felt a oneness with the one Holy Communion is all about. Don't ask me how. Perhaps it was because, as Jesus knew, it was about his time to go to death, so would I soon go to death. But what would happen afterwards? I placed the wafer on my trembling lips and let it dissolve slowly on my tongue. The wine, I knew, was symbolic of his shed blood, the blood I had been told as a little girl that was shed for mankind and me on the cross. I tipped the container and paused momentarily, wondering if this would be my last communion ever. Yes, of course, it would be. Tears started welling up inside me as I realized this would never happen again. Then I went home. The doctor instructed my husband to feed me with liquid food every half hour the rest of my days. He told him to never let me have solid food again. At home, I lived with the machine and the bottle that pulled the pus out of my stomach. I was dying slowly. It was only a matter of time. A devout Christian friend of mine intimately aware of my situation, began trying to encourage me to watch Christian television. I really wasn't interested, but to pacify her, I told her I would. Upon her constant prompting, I finally found the station she suggested I watch. When I tuned into that station, 
Pat Robertson was talking and was going to start praying for people watching the program. He said, it, he said it didn't matter what the problem was, quote, if it's spiritual, physical, mental, or whatever, it makes no difference. We're going to pray. Now, put your hands next to whatever you want healed and just believe with me. Just believe, he said. When he said, just believe, it was so powerful. It was like a fist slammed deep into my heart. I thought, no one is watching. No one would know. I'm going to try you, God. What have I got to lose? Then I began to talk outright with God. I got testy with him, ashamed as I now uh, admit to it. Okay, we'll see, God. If you're like the God I used to believe in when I was a little girl, let's see. Let's see what you can do. Let me live or let me die. And I meant every word I said. I laid my hands on my stomach and repeated the prayer. Then something inside of me began to happen. My goodness, I took note of how well I suddenly felt. I grew keenly aware that a heavy cloud had been removed from me. I realized I was light as a feather, like the whole world had been on me moments before, and now I was free from it. I wanted to cry, and I wanted to laugh at the same time. That night, I went to sleep with a piece of God inside me. It was like he rocked me to sleep in his loving arms. The next morning, I woke up like I had done so many times before. Next to me was the little, the bottle. Next to me was a bottle to collect the pus that would need to drain during the hours of the night. But that morning, no pus. The bottle was empty. The next thing that happened may be hard for some to believe. A voice inside of me, a distinct voice spoke saying these words, look at your tummy. Now, I hated to look at my tummy. It was ugly and gross. It was cut up so bad and scarred and mutilated and bloody that I absolutely abhorred looking at it. But, being obedient to this strange voice, I slowly opened my house coat and cautiously peeked inside. At that moment, I also wanted to know whose voice this was speaking to me from inside. It was a different voice, one I had never heard. And I said out loud, who is this speaking? Who's talking to me? At the same time, I forced myself to look at my tummy. And to my utter amazement, I could see the skin had healed over my bleeding wound. And then I heard the voice speaking to me again. I have healed you, and you will never break open again. At that moment, I knew it was the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of God, speaking to me. In three days, I was totally healed. My stomach was never to break open again. God healed me physically, and more importantly, I was starting to be healed spiritually. That was over 40 years ago. Since that time, I have allowed the Lord to not only be my Savior, but also my Lord. I believe God allowed me to be healed so I could tell others about Him. And I can't thank Him enough for giving me numerous opportunities to do so. I do hope, do hope this story has blessed you, and most importantly of all, if you haven't made peace with God our Father through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ the Son, I encourage you to do so. Wow. Now we're going to hear the testimony of her husband, a part of his testimony. 
His name is Jacob de Rockefeller. I would commit suicide. Why? Because right from the very beginning of my marriage, I had serious problems. My wife became ill the very first year of our marriage, which brought great disappointment and unhappiness to me. While the condition of sickness in my wife was steadily growing worse with her in and out of hospitals with one surgery after another, one crisis after another, spending more and more time in the hospitals, I eventually turned from bad to worse. During all this time, I was constantly looking for love and peace and fulfillment. I was also looking for acceptance by other people, but never finding it. Consequently, I turned to alcohol like I had never done before until I was a slave to it. When the drowning and the alcohol wasn't strong enough, I turned to drugs. The byproducts of drinking and taking drugs was the abandonment of all morals I was ever taught. I delighted in wrecking cars and people's property, stirring up trouble in the lives of people, gambling away anything I could get my hands on, including my wife's clothes while she was lying in the hospital. In my mental and spiritual depravity, I hated people for every imaginable reason. Some for being of a different nationality, some for having the wrong color of skin, and the rest for no good reason at all. Finally, after 11 years of marriage and eight years of that merely existing miserably while my wife was away in the hospitals, going through some 17 different major surgeries, the doctor sent her home from the hospital to die. Those were the hard and unbearable days of my life, full of heartache and frustration. And by the end of 11 years, I knew I was a total and complete failure as a man and a husband. So the decision was made. I would commit suicide. I would go where I deserved to be, in hell. I drove my car wildly onto the expressway pushing the accelerator all the way to the floor, I wanted all the speed I could get. Up ahead, I spotted a concrete wall of an overpass bridge in the distance. That would be my target. I would drive the car into it and finish off my misery. Hell, I would soon be in hell. My mind raced like a crazed animal running faster and faster to its place of death. I would soon taste death and hell for eternity. Help me God, I started weeping and choking. Please God, let me die some other way. Let someone else kill me so that I might not have to go to hell, that horrible pit. Or else if you would, let me live in love and peace. Please, I'm scared to death to die. Please, if you would let me live, change my life, change me. Let me become a someone else. I can't stand myself anymore. As I kept racing ever closer toward the concrete wall, crying out to God, suddenly I realized the car motor had stopped running. By the time the car reached the decided place of suicide, the car coasted to a full stop a few feet away from the concrete wall. I made every attempt to start it, but it would not start. At that moment, for the first time in my life, I recognized the presence of God all around and within me. Deep within my heart, I heard a voice similar to mine say, What you need is Jesus. I began pleading, oh Jesus, my God, save me and change my life. Suddenly, a peace came over me, 
filling my heart and mind, and tears began to bathe my face. They were tears of joy. As the horror and hurt and all the tortures of life melted away, I breathed in the presence of his great love and light. Again, I heard the same voice say to me from within, Welcome home, Jacob, my son. I've been waiting for you. At that moment, through the window of my mind, for the first time in my life, I could see the great mystery. I could see Father God in the face of Jesus Christ. He was no longer some kind of mythical or mystical great power or force or some universal cosmic potentate that just came out of hiding from somewhere in a deep cold space or faraway heavens. No. At that moment, he became my personal God. A personal God precious enough to intervene at the last second and save my life. And then he performed a miracle in my midst. I have to mention that I had been a regular user of marijuana, and a friend of mine had given me a large amount of it wrapped up uh, in a plastic bread bag. The huge bag of marijuana was sitting beside me on the front seat of the car. I looked into the rearview mirror and was blinded by the flashing lights of a police car, knowing that I had no way of escaping without that large bag of marijuana being detected. I suddenly sank into great fear. Once again, I pleaded with God, please, sweet Jesus, spare me from this trouble. From this awful guilt and shame I will suffer if I am found with this marijuana. I knew the charge would be devastating because I was already in a lot of trouble. In my despairing cry and plea, once again I heard his beautiful, comforting voice inside say to me, Trust in me. Trust in me. Trust in me. And I asked, oh God, what will I tell them? He said, trust in me and tell the truth. The miracle took place before my eyes. Two officers were blind to the bag of marijuana sitting beside me. Then the Lord somehow confused the communication of the policemen, and they wound up in a heavy argument right there in front of me. I did not have valid registration for the vehicle, but one of the officers handed me back my driver's license. He angrily told me to get the blower on my heater fixed and my wipers before I wound up killing myself and someone else because of my fogged up windows. <laughs> I thanked him and started the car without any problem. Remember, the car had stopped running by itself earlier. I drove immediately home, anxious to tell my wife about my encounter with God. Now this didn't get recorded in the written testimony, but I interviewed both of them on audio cassette tape, transcribed it into text, let them read it, and then it eventually got released, oh, many, many years ago. Uh, some you know, close to 30 years ago, now, as of 2019. And when Jacob come home, he was all excited to tell his wife what had happened. And the first thing to come out of Kay's mouth was, uh, don't tell me you had an encounter with God. And he said back to her, how did you know? And she said, I did too, let me tell you about it. It had happened near the same time frame when she got miraculously healed and he got delivered and set free from suicide and uh, made his connection with Jesus Christ officially. He goes on, Had you looked into my face before that glorious day of my meeting with God, you would have, would have seen the wretchedness of sin, hatred, guilt, and meanness. I know because I had to look at that face every day in the mirror. 
But after my glorious experience, his glory was transformed and shining in my face. To all this, I say, to God be the glory, and I leave you with this. I did not come to call the righteous. That is, those who believe that they can get into heaven on their own goodness. But sinners, this is Jesus talking. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. That's found in Mark 2, 17. We're all sinners, by the way. The Bible says we are. And we're all in need of having God forgive us for all of our sins, that they might be forgiven by God and uh, not held against us on the judgment day. Well, now we're going to go into a part two of Jacob's story that really fascinating, I think. Let's continue on with their life story. As I grew in my relationship with the Lord, an incident happened that changed the course of my life. Before I start sharing it, I want to say that I believe it's possible to walk on dangerous ground with God. I believe there are occasions when we uh, are thrust into the supernatural or spiritual dimension, and we must be very careful how we react to that experience after we come back to the world as we know it. I want everyone to know that the experience I'm about to tell you is just one of those circumstances where I walk on dangerous ground if I leave the impression with anyone that I am someone special, or that I'm more spiritual than someone else, or that I deserve to have experiences that other people don't have. If I was ever to start to do that, I believe God would take me right out of this life and let me die prematurely because I am trusting him to never let me fall from pride like Satan did. It would be my prayer that God would always receive the glory for everything I say and do, and if not, then have him take me right out of this life. The first thing I want to say is that I was not asking God to have an experience to leave my body and go into the heavenlies. No. I was at my church engaged in intercessory prayer. There were several people in the room when it happened. I was age 30 and had given my heart to the Lord about eight months previous. Before I share this experience, I feel it necessary to say that there were thousands of Yugoslavian people in the Detroit uh, area, Detroit, Michigan area, and I didn't know but a handful that were saved. I started praying in a prayer room at Bethesda Missionary Temple in Detroit. At first I was kneeling and then I sat down on the back of my legs leaning into the pew. I remember being really broken up before God. Whether somebody could tell me the difference between intercessory prayer or travailing prayer, I didn't know at the time. I now know it was intercessory prayer. Anyway, I was broken up and I was crying out to God. At other times, I would be singing to God in the spirit, not in an understandable language, but in tongues. I was interceding on behalf of the numerous unsaved Yugoslavian people in the Detroit area, broken up because so few of them had a true understanding of what it was like to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to be full of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I was torn up because I knew they were going to hell. I was begging and pleading with God not to let them go to the pit. As I prayed in the Spirit, sometimes praying in my own language, I continued to beg the Lord to do something to turn them around. Then the Lord began to speak to me. He said, You pray for them. You do it. I continued to pray, alternating back and forth from tongues to my uh, Croatian or Yugoslavian language. And then I asked again, Lord, is there anyone praying for these people? Is there anyone? Suddenly out of my mouth, the tongue stopped and the Holy Spirit gave me the interpretation in my native language. There is no one 
They are your people and they are your inheritance. A moment later, my spirit left my body. I know it left because I could look down and see myself still kneeling down, leaning against that pew. In a split second, I was thousands of miles above the earth, if not millions. I glanced behind me at one point and saw the earth was about the size of a golf ball. I didn't feel anything as I was traveling. I didn't feel friction or motion. As I was moving away from the earth, I knew where I was going, for the Lord had spoken to me as soon as I had left my body. I'm going to show you your inheritance. I continued to move away from the earth, and again I had the feeling to turn and glance back, which I did. But this time it was different. This time I was not looking through my eyes, but I was literally looking through the eyes of the Lord. This is difficult to describe. Somehow I was positioned behind the Lord and could see through the back of his head. I was never allowed to see the front of him. He was invisible and I was looking through him as though he only had one eye. I saw planet Earth in colors I had never seen before and never seen since then. As best as I can describe, that they were kind of a golden green. As I looked through the Lord's eye, it reminded me of looking through one of those telescopes they used to use on the pirate ship centuries ago because as I gazed down at the Earth, it began to get bigger. I could see Yugoslavia as though I was only a few thousand feet above it. Now remember, I knew I was thousands and thousands of miles above the earth, and yet through God's eye, I could see Detroit, Michigan, and the country of Yugoslavia all at the same time. Soon the land was magnified more, and then I was able to clearly see the countryside. Roads, houses, fields, trees, ditches that I used to jump over. I could see every place I had ever walked as a little boy, all simultaneously at the same time. For a brief moment, I would say the majority of my concentration covered roughly an 80 mile diameter or about a three county wide area where I was born in Yugoslavia. Suddenly, the Lord allowed me to see something I'll never forget. I could actually see a blade of grass growing. It reminded me of time lapse photography as I marveled at what I was watching. Then I was able to see even closer, looking right into the fibers of the grass and then individual molecules molecules simultaneously i saw it all i guess as god sees it let's take a moment and let me describe again the ability god gave me all at the same time i had multiple perceptions of distance and fields of vision although there were different stages of magnifications I was totally aware of all of them, and yet not distracted or overwhelmed by one more than the other. In other words, I knew and could see that I was millions of miles above the earth. But yet, I could look over Detroit, and at the same time, look over the land where I played as a child in Yugoslavia. While I could do all of that, I could z still zero in and inspect the insides of a growing blade of grass, all the while never losing any of the other visual perceptions. Never was there a jumping up and down of different levels of distances like one might imagine having to do. Simultaneously, I saw it all, I guess, as God sees it. Then I was instantly removed from behind the Lord. 
removed from his presence and was positioned in the air approximately 50 feet above the earth. It was as though I was dangling in midair with nothing keeping me there. I was looking down and as I was doing so, I saw an open square. It was the main square in Belgrade, Yugoslavia. I had never been there before, so I had no way of knowing previous what to look at, at least to my remembrance. In the middle of the square was a platform, similar to the kind you would see at a Billy Graham crusade years ago. When I saw, I asked, Lord, what is that? The Lord replied, you pray, this is your inheritance. I am giving it to you. I asked, Lord, how? I looked down at the crowds of people again, and I looked at the platform. Someone was standing on the platform preaching, and as I looked closer, I could see that person was me. And just like that, whoosh, it was over. Next thing I remember was that I was back in my body, painfully aware that I was still in that kneeling, sitting position where I had been when my spirit had left my body. As I opened my eyes, I began to feel terrible all over. I was acutely aware of all the aches and pains in my body that I normally would just take for granted. I was also aware of the feeling that I was confined, as though I was suddenly put in a prison. I remember struggling terribly with that feeling because I didn't want to be back in my body. While I had been in the presence of the Lord in the spirit, there was such peace. Now that indescribable peace was suddenly gone. The physical world was my reality once more, and I had to deal with it. But this I say, whatever I must do, whatever pain and suffering I must go through in this life to make it back into the presence of God, I will endure. I will wait patiently because nothing in this life that I've experienced compares to that feeling of peace I encountered when I was positioned next to the Lord during that experience. <coughs> Excuse me. My only prayer is that you will believe me when I say that it is worth it all. All the pain, all the suffering, all the misery, all the hardships, all the confusion, all the difficulties, all of these things that we experience to one degree or another or are experiencing now, they flee away instantly when you are in the presence of God. Dear one, whatever you do, don't give up. Developing a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is worth it all, and your time is coming when one day you will yell throughout the universe, I made it. And after you do that, walk reverently up to Jesus Christ. Look him in the eye and thank him for making it all possible. Well, I shared at the beginning that I was going to share a few other things here about this couple. We were publishing, my wife and I were publishing Christian testimonies in written form only at the time. This was back around 1981, 82, maybe 1983. I hadn't been a born-again Christian more than just a few years. But God called me early to publish testimonies and share the gospel message with whoever uh, God got the... Uh, testimonies into the hands of and to encourage people of course um, I got a phone call phone call from Jacob Dorakovic Jacob says you don't know who I am but uh, I was made aware that you publish written testimonies and I just feel in my heart that we're to meet is there any way that you could drive from Western Michigan, where you live, to Detroit, and we could meet for an evening. 
Uh, he said, my wife and I are on an Indian reservation, Native American Indian reservation in Arizona, and a friend of mine that I used to chum around with is getting married, and he has asked that I perform the wedding for he and his wife. They paid our way out to Detroit and to go back, and I feel God wants me to do that. Um, and so we're going to do that here in a few days. And if you could drive down to Detroit and meet us there at the wedding, um, you could go home with us after the wedding and spend the night where we're going to sleep, or you can drive back home to Grand Rapids, Michigan area, whatever you want to do. Um, I prayed about it and I said, yeah, I want to meet you. So we went to the wedding. <laughs> it was all in Yugoslavian language. We didn't understand a word. Um, after it was over, after all the things you do after a wedding was accomplished, we went to his to the house where he was staying. I think his sister. I don't remember right now. It's not important. And and um, I I told him. I said, you know, I'd really like to get alone with you if we could. Um, can we do that? He said, yeah, let's let everybody sleep and let's go out in the car and talk. So we did. And we talked, he talked for hours into the night. He shared this testimony pretty much as well as his wife's. I had, I had no clue. I had no idea what God had done in either of their lives. When it all got done, he, it was almost breaking day, and I, I shared with him, I said, you know, I just really would like you to pray about letting us publish your testimony. And uh, so he said he would pray about it, and so in time, uh, we did in fact publish, actually, both of these testimonies. Um, his heart was to minister in Yugoslavia at that time, as was his wife's. Um, somehow, once this testimony, or the, both of these testimonies got released out into the public, and we, there weren't many copies available. We didn't have much money to get them around. We didn't have any great marketing uh, avenue to get them out, but in time, Jacob down on this Indian reservation in Arizona gave me a call and he said, you won't believe what happened. A copy of this testimony of ours got over to somebody in London and they read it and they feel that God wants us to go to Yugoslavia uh, and they're going to pay our way to get there uh, because we don't have the money to go. And uh, so... Praise the Lord, you know. What can you say? Praise the Lord. Well, some more time went by. I don't remember now. Weeks went by, and I got another phone call from Jacob. He said, you won't believe what has happened. What's that? He said, well, there was a guy in uh, Chicago that I used to party with, and we raised Cain over in Chicago in our younger age. Went out, got drunk, raised Cain, and uh, got a lot of trouble for it. Um, this guy's called me up and uh, said he got my testimony and he's got moved by it. And he says, How, you know, what's going on with you going to Yugoslavia? And Jacob says, well, I have to get a passport first before we can go. Um, and this guy said, well, I happen to work for the passport people. And I can pull strings and we can get you one very quickly instead of having to wait weeks and weeks and weeks and months. So it came together very quickly. Jacob and Kay went to England. They ministered there a while and then they went on over to Yugoslavia. Long story short, they set up a church over there somewhere in Yugoslavia and began to pioneer a local church fellowship. In time, Jacob ended up passing, and he didn't make it to Belgrade to minister to the multitudes. For whatever reason, it never happened. God took him home. But that might have been an enticement, my guess, not knowing for sure. It was an enticement to get him there. 
Uh, he was an evangelist, and it excited him to be able to minister to multitudes of Yugoslavians living in the old country. Um, as of today, as far as I know, like so many other people that we publish testimonies on, whether written or video, both, we just don't have time to keep up with them, and they're usually out there doing ministry. I would say from the time we started being obedient to the call of publishing testimonies to present, I would say at least half, if not three quarters of the people that we did testimonies on, God had a call on their life to touch many, many others as God called them to do. Many of them were evangelists of sorts, street evangelists. But Jacob and Kay went over and pioneered a church fellowship over there in Yugoslavia. Jacob ended up getting to go to heaven a number of years back, and so Kay remained alive. And uh, I heard, we heard from her briefly about three years ago, uh, roughly, and she was still uh, helping pioneer that local church fellowship that she and Jacob initially set up. They had a number of people attending. They were equipping, discipling other people to fill in and do what was necessary. Kay was getting older, had a lot of age issues like we all have as we get older. So she may be in heaven with Jacob now or may not be, I don't know. But uh, I just really thought it was just so neat that they could end up getting back to Yugoslavia and being obedient to what they believe God called them to. And uh, can't wait to get in heaven and meet both of them and hear about all the details that happened in between that we've not heard about yet. Not that that'll probably make much difference when we get up in heaven, but uh, just neat to, to uh, see how God works in the lives of his people. I pray that somehow, some way, this has blessed you, encouraged you. Um, God uses who he wants. He's just looking for obedient people to do things his way in accordance with his new covenant word, the Holy Bible, in accordance with his rhema words for their life. When he speaks to our spirit, do this, go, be obedient. That's what J. K. K. and uh, Jacob Dorakovic did. They were humble people, but obedient people, sold out for Jesus Christ, sold out to God the Father, sold out to the Holy Spirit, sold out to help advance the kingdom of God in the lives of people. And I am quite sure that their testimony continues to reach out, God using it to touch the lives of other people. My friend, if you have yet to put your salvation testimony either in writing or speaking it on video and putting it out on YouTube, I would strongly encourage you to not let the devil talk you out of it. If we've seen one, we've seen multitudes of Christians where we were privileged to publish their testimony and in time see God use that to open doors uh, for them to walk more fully into the calling God has in their lives and to see lives change for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We backed off of the writing testimonies because I've had to do so much editing of them over the years, rewrites and editing, and I've, I've lost a ton of grace for doing that. And um, I have a whole lot more grace for video taping, video editing, putting these video clips up on YouTube. So many people uh, are preferring video over written testimonies and with the availability of the cell phones and getting on the internet, it makes sense that it's just a lot easier for people to access testimonies on uh, desktop computers and uh, tablets and cell phones and what other technology. People can print out written uh, dialogue of these testimonies from YouTube if they want and then 
do whatever the Lord feels to have them do with them. So my friend, um, I find so much of my time exhorting born again Christians to not wait forever. If I've heard this once, I've heard it so many times, I want to throw up spiritually. Well, God's not done with my testimony yet. Well, I have a whole book to write. You know, well, after 30 years of being born again, you don't have a testimony you can share that God can use 20 years, 10 years. Christians really let the devil do a whole lot more of their thinking. I've had a number of Christians I've challenged years ago to let me publish their testimony. Oh, oh, it's not done yet. Oh, 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 I'm still... You know, God's still writing my test. Oh, 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 I think God wants me to write a book. And a book never gets written. Their testimony never gets put down into writing where God can duplicate it or it's on t a video where it can be duplicated that way and they go to heaven. Their testimony gets buried other than maybe they shared it with a few people. It gets buried. God can't use it. Is God obligated to use our salvation born again testimony? Not really. But here's the bottom line. I guarantee you he can't use it until we give it to him to use. We don't have any right to hoard the salvation testimony, to keep it top secret, to keep it in a closet, to bury it. We don't have any right to keep that to ourselves. God is the one who wrote our salvation testimony. Can't we give it back to him in a way where he can use it for his glory and his purposes? Well, thanks for letting me share that. God bless you.